morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much. First of all, for inviting me. For, uh, thank you very much. I was, uh, to be honest, a little bit uh, honored and uh, also a little bit confused to what I'm going to say here. Um, as you know, as, as you heard, my background is more from the cultural heritage side and uh, preservation, conservation of uh, mainly the built heritage. Um, but um, um, I thought it was very interesting. Um, when I was young, I was born into this uh, uh, exciting music scenery and what was at that time called experimental music and so on. So I, I feel very, you know, uh, more like a family here. So I'm not to, I'm <coughs> so what I'm trying to say is that uh, I've always been interested to see how contemporary art could also be a link into the heritage and also the heritage preservation. So, <coughs> so I, I think that um, um, my experience could be of some interest to you. I'd like to start with uh, what, where we are. You know we're in Halland. Halland is the region south of Gothenburg, as you all noticed here. And uh, we did a survey here a couple of years ago where we tried to understand and <coughs> also tried to analyze where are the um, historic buildings in this region. So we made a rather huge survey. We, we actually visited every single building in Halland. It's a little bit more than 130,000. And from that, we had an idea that, let's say, 10% of these could make a tell the story about how. So we say that 10% of them could be of interest to preserve for the future. And this was actually a national program, but Hala was the only region that was able to make this survey. So we developed a new system, a new methodology to, to, to make this kind of inventory, and it was also based on GIS. <laughs> so anyway, so this was the result. So, and you can, I think you can imagine the feeling that you see this, and or when you saw this, and you understand that Halland uh, has such an important heritage. So, <coughs> I presented this for the regional politicians, for the board of, uh, for, for the board of region, and uh, one more time I was very satisfied both with the result, both of the value of heritage in, in Hala, but also that we were able to do this. But <coughs> the result was, I was not really what I was expect, uh, expecting. It was, okay, is this good? I mean, look at this map. We cannot do anything, the politician said, because they just saw the obstacles. They saw the obstacle for building a new road, or building a new railway, or building new settlements, or new houses, structures, or anything. So we understood that, okay, we can do it in the traditional way, which is preservation through protection, or we can do this in the other way. That means that we can see what are the interests from the decision makers here. Can we convince them with their own arguments? What are the importance? So we try to understand what are the importance for the decision makers. I mean, they don't wake up in the morning and think that how can I preserve the cultural heritage? I mean, that is not the first question during the breakfast. But they have completely different. Yeah. And I was listening to the radio now, maybe you did it as well. And today the biggest party in Sweden starts their Congress, the Social Democratic Party. And uh, the most important issue for the Social Democratic Party in Sweden, the government, um, no, sorry, the three most important questions, they are, what do you think is the most important for the biggest part in Sweden? The three most important is job creation, job creation, and job creation. So, and I think that goes for more or less all politicians, maybe around the world. So, if you're going to see how you can negotiate with them and also to understand and increase the value of cultural heritage, but also their cultural policy, you need to, I mean, to negotiate them most often on their arena. They most often come to our arenas, we have to negotiate them to their arenas. So, <coughs> we did it um, some years ago and just uh, visited the uh, uh, Harpinger uh, windmill. 
And this building, let's say 10, 15 years ago, was supposed to be demolished. It was in very bad shape. I mean, it was raining through the uh, roof, and, uh, and uh, from every year it makes the cost for restoration became more and more expensive. And I, I think we, when we started the first survey, we thought it would cost around, it was a couple of hundred thousand Swedish crowns, and then it, next year it was more than a million. And in the end, when we restored it, it was 8 million Swedish crowns. So it was dramatically increased the cost every year. So we didn't have this kind of resources, and we didn't have this kind of legal framework so we can uh, protect it. So we needed to find some other arguments to restore this building. And at that time, one more time, it was about job creation. Because we can, we understood that the, <coughs> the unemployment situation in Sweden at that time was very dramatic, very high, and especially in the construction industry. And in the construction industry, they couldn't find working places for the young, um, the, the, the trainees, or <coughs> so, so, or apprentices. So we need to find working places so they actually can train the new generation of construction workers. So this is how we convince them to restore them and invest all this money in this uh, restoration project, so they can make the. Um, the construction in the workers in the construction sector younger or something. So they can invite younger people to the construction sector. So we got a lot of money and restored it. And after the restoration was completed, we could have, <coughs> they could also mill and make harpling and bread there. And the interesting thing was that um, the biggest company in Sweden uh, in the construction industry uh, it was NCC that actually restored it, but uh, together with Skanska, and Skanska today I heard it's going to be the uh, company that will build the new airport in New York. So they will destroy Lagardia and build a new one, and then Skanska just got it. So this is a world player, and they were so proud of this restoration. So th for two years it was just like a show off room. So they invited other construction companies from Sweden, from Scandinavia, maybe from other countries, to just see how good the training system is in Sweden for training new construction workers. So, so we understood that uh, that was a way to, to see if also we can invite the construction industry to, to uh, conservation. Anyway, after that you saw that uh, uh, Juliana and Mick bought it and uh, restored it something that is even more exciting than just the heritage. And another building <coughs> that we restore is Chulon Castle. I don't know if you have the time, but I think it is included in this uh, project, isn't it? And um, we also restore uh, <coughs> other culture things. Uh, we had an old industrial site that we restored, trust me, <coughs> transformed into a, an artist village. And it was, uh, I think it was apartment for uh, nine or ten uh, artists and also studios for, I think it was 12 studios and, and an art gallery and uh, also a restaurant and so on. Uh, theater in La Hall, also the Museum of Drawings, which was really exciting because we just used girls to build it. So it was 100% of girls, uh, young girls uh, to build the whole structure. And a little bit funny was it was also funded by the European Union uh, for an equal project. So when it was uh, evaluated, <coughs> we said it was fantastic. We only used ghosts to build this museum. But uh, <laughs> it was uh, not so successful from the European part because it was an equal project. So they thought we should be 50% of boys in the project. Anyway. So it was uh, some other um, buildings, but that meant <coughs> that we found a system that we could also not just preserve the building, we could also start planning the activities taking place in a restored building. So we can start to see how can you actually use the buildings, not just conserve them, but also find them better useful. So <coughs> another <coughs> structure was this thing, and I think you can recognize it if you just look out of the window. So this is the um, agreement of and Grimiton, uh, as Harding read, uh, well, I mean, as, as also Shulamon, was supposed to be destroyed. 
Schönholm, nobody said that, but the cost was too high for 60 million Swedish crowns to just to restore it, and nobody had this kind of money. So we found it one more time from other sectors. The same thing here, when um, we heard that uh, the owner was going to destroy uh, Grimeton in the beginning of the 90s, it was not the whole uh, complex, but it was uh, tower number three, I think it was. Tower number three and number four was supposed to be knocked down because they were in such a bad shape. And the cost was too high to, to just to paint them. I mean, <coughs> first of all, we had to see if we can find money for the painting. And um, just one tower, I think it cost uh, around seven to eight million crowns just to paint one of the towers. And look at one, it's the whole antenna is six towers. And then they have this guy. I mean, the building over there. So it also had to maintain. So it was an enormous amount of money. And uh, the annual budget in this region at the time was one million, or increased to two million. When we started this project, it was 60,000 Swedish kronos. 60,000. So we need to find someone else to pay it. And to get someone else to pay it, you need to have to negotiate with them and convince them that uh, they will spend the money on this. In this case, <coughs> We, you will hear much about the board, much more about the historic values, so, but we understood that it was the only remaining transmitter in the world, the only way you transmit in the world. And then we understand that this is, has maybe some universal value, and uh, my colleagues at uh, the country administrative board started this process to see if it also could be inscribed on the World Heritage List, and now it's been more than 10 years ago already. But anyway, <coughs> so we found the money somewhere else. So what we needed to understand was <coughs> so where are these decisions made? Where are the decisions for the budgets that in the end would pay in the, the uh, heritage but also the culture sector? So, so we needed to understand why they're made and who, who makes them and, and, um, and so on. So <coughs> if you go to the general policy, I mean the from the Swedish side, one more time, it is about job creation, job creation, job creation. And when if you go to Europe, it is expressed in this way. They want to develop Europe from an inclusive, sustainable and, and innovation-driven way. <coughs> and one more time. So now we see if we can understand both heritage under this umbrella, but also culture. Because if we can translate it to the important decision makers, we think that we can get some more resources. Is it just bullshit or is it bullshit? Well, I can say it is bullshit. You need to take to a talk in this way. And what we did here in Holland in the late 90s, 1999, I think it was, we heard that in Europe they would um, make a decision about the new budget. And in this European budget, there is 50% you, you know the budget in Europe, I think, but 50% is, is for agriculture, 30, one third is for the structural funds. So what are the structural funds? Well, we can say that's the money that goes to regional development. So one third goes to the structure, and, it, and it's much, much, much more money than going to culture. Culture is, I mean, it's almost zero percentage of EU's budget. But structure funds is one third. So we thought that culture should be included in the structure funds. But in the 1990s, it was not. So we organized a big lobby program, and um, it was me together with the former um, domestic minister of domestic affairs, something in Sweden, <coughs> that was uh, um, in Brussels and talk, but we're also organizing a conference here in, in Amsterdam, and not so far away from Harpingen at uh, Tilsand. And <coughs> there we had invited people from the European Commission that could actually speak about the situation, but also to see if we could convince the important politicians to also just have the word culture mentioned in the structural funds. So it was. <coughs> 
decision was made and we, everybody agreed upon what we called the Hallam Declaration. So we sent the Hallam Declaration to all the governments in Europe and all the commissioners and etc. etc. And three months later the decision was made and the capture of mentions in the structural funds. So what are the structural funds? One of the time is one third. But <coughs> Interreg, for instance, is structural funds. So the project, so you are invited here, are financed by the Interreg, which is the structural funds. So you can see how we can spend money on culture from this um, budget post. Anyway, last year <coughs> there was a new decision, and now culture is not mentioned anymore. So one more time, after 10 years of culture, <coughs> goes back, so now one more time, it is more basic about the job creation also from the European point of view, and the European politicians, they agree upon what <coughs> is supposed to happen is economic growth. So, <coughs> okay. So if you go to the regional level now, because for instance the structural funds, the decisions are made on the regional level. So <coughs> today they agreed upon that it is a regional competition around the world. That means that every single region has to be a much more competitive player on the global markets so say. So now <coughs> every region in Europe, they are working with this small specialization strategies, which we can call, used to be called regional development strategies or something. And it is also um, an agreement what it's supposed to be, but it is about making the region more competitive. But when it was boiled down to the Swedish, and I think to the most of the, oh, sorry, so in this structure fund, no, only in this uh, regional game, today we also have Included the uh, uh, culture policies. So the culture policies, I think it's Sweden actually has been more emphasized and more enhanced in, in these programs. But um, there are so, so, so many of these uh, strategies. But when it comes to <coughs> the structure fund, one more time, today it is about technical innovation, it is about uh, SMEs, small, medium uh, enterprises, and also how to lower the CO2. So this these are the objectives, and this is, if you want to have money from the structure fund, you need to express the project in this way. So today, you can say it's important for culture and more. You need to say it's good for the enterprises, <coughs> or for lowering the CO2 or whatever. So we tried to understand this. <coughs> so we did a survey here in, uh, in, uh, in Halla, and some other regions in Sweden, to see what are the effects of culture for regional development. What are, can you understand if you increase the participation in culture activities, can you also see results when it comes to regional development? <coughs> so together with some colleagues, maybe you know Pierre Di Sacco or Massimo Boshima, or for instance also Guido Farili, and we, we did a project first here in, in, in Halle where we saw, first we made a map of all the culture activities and all the culture facilities in the region and we found almost 7,000 and gave them, each of them, GIS point or coordinators and then the first thing is you can make very easy uh, like clustering maps like this, where, where are the theatres, you can see there are mostly in the hamster where you stay this night and here we have something else, I can tell you, it is uh, uh, craftsmanship. Here you have music, and uh, we are, <coughs> there's some, some white spots there, but we are in the north actually. But there you can see they play music more or less everywhere <laughs> in our history. <laughs> um, and here you have uh, something else, it's advertising, and here you have the cultural heritage, conservation projects, and so on. But one more time, if you give this to the decision makers, it's almost like the first map. What, what, can, uh, what can you do? Can you make a political decision from this? Can you increase the budget for anything from this? Can you make it more easy to, to, to make art here in, 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 in Halle? We don't think so. So we need to understand and analyze the relation between this to see if we can find the impact of culture for regional development. So we start to see the <coughs> clustering process also, if you also included other statistics. So <coughs> from that 
of them. We can make this map where we can see the impact of culture for uh, regional development. So you can see that the house seems to be the most important here. And uh, we are close to bar by now, so it's a little bit not simple. But the interesting thing, with this algorithm, we can also forecast the future. So tomorrow, we will see that it will be more important in Falkenberg. And it will be more important altogether. Culture have, will have a bigger impact on the economic growth in, in, in Halland. But we can see that Falkenberg will be very important. So now, when we present this for the decision makers and policy makers, they became more interested compared to the first map. But they were really interested when they saw them, what will happen the day after tomorrow. Because then Falkenberg seems to be disappearing. So why is this happening? This is what we do research on. But <coughs> we, we think that you know, the theory says, says that and uh, the more active the participation is in culture, the more, let's say, open you are for new things. And for new things could be also, in this uh, sense, trans translated to maybe to creativity and also openness for these things, but also the openness for innovation in the end. And this is what the politicians were looking for, remember? Innovation-driven economy. So we can see that <coughs> it seems to be has some relation here. But just in Falkenberg, we also saw that the, they were less active in particip participation in culture, meaning that was not so much culture in Falkenberg. So even if they made this investment, which is actually a new railway station, the traditional way to get economic growth is in from infrastructure. So we can see that the infrastructure is there, the new railway is there, but it seems to just be lasting for a very short time. Uh, short time. Oh. You're right. So anyway, so this when we show this, um, this means that if you want to have sustainable development in Falkenberg, for instance, you need to invest more in culture. This is the lesson learned from us. So, <clears throat> but we can also break down to see the rela relation between single activities and single very um, statistics what's happening in the region. So here we can find the most important part is here in the middle. <coughs> and this point is actually statistics about, um, we can say open mind. Some statistics for this. But the country is in the end, we can say. And, uh, and it's, um, we, <coughs> so, so what we try to do now is to see how we can get country more into the center because there we have, from the theory, uh, the most effective way. So, so what we do now is <coughs> we, we just involved in developing a new software where we actually can simulate political decision. What happens if you do you change one of these uh, statistics? What will happen in the, in the big picture? So here's another region, and uh, I just wanted to show you the similar uh, illustration here. And in this region, it, it is a little bit north, Skaravar for you who speak Swedish. Uh, and there we saw this is not open minds that is the most important factor for, for regional development. It's actually two years of secondary school. So what does it mean? Is it good or is it bad? Well, I think we all agree on it's not so good. Because <coughs> that means that you know, uh, it's not so easy to start something there um, and find someone that has a higher level of degrees or so. so that means that you can start this kind of innovative uh, 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 produce or whatever you call it. So where is culture? Culture is actually in the very far end of the whole system. So that means that the effects from cultural activities is less important in this region. So <coughs> for when we see what is called the creative industries is also open. So just take a look at one of these spots. Here they are culture. But inside, which is more important for the regional development here, is forestry and it's uh, hunting and fishing and things like that. That is more important. And here, it's the retired <coughs> people income. I mean, the, what they are spending has more impact on the, of, uh, the growth in this region and cultural activities. So it's completely. 
the opposite of what we talk about when we talk, when, for instance, Sackler speaks about the 3.0 things like that. Here at Scarborough, they are known for the video game. They have a very good education at, the, at the, their university college there, and uh, but also the famous music studios in Scala. So anyway, <coughs> so we have now some conclusions when we are given to the, the regional uh, policy makers in this time in, in West Sweden, West Area, Dance Region, and uh, we are starting a new project here in in uh, <coughs> some other uh, parts of West Sweden Region, including the Gothenburg Region. So we start, uh, we already started, but for real, we started two weeks from now. So we think that we soon we'll have a whole picture of the West uh, Sweden region, which will be also be interesting for, for how long, because it's close by. And um, we also do this kind of stuff somewhere else. So we have some <coughs> many ideas how we can uh, go on with research, policy making, and as well as projects and so on. And also, <coughs> a couple of weeks ago, we, from the European Commission level, we see how this could also be implemented in the new uh, European agenda for research, cut um, heritage research and, and innovation. So now we see the impact of this kind of thinking also for the, for the new research in Sweden. So I was one of the authors for, for, for this one. So as we say, grazie mille.